Hello and welcome to part 22 of our Dominion's Guide for New Players. So in this part, I think what we're going to do is we're going to have a little bit of a retrospective about what happened in the war with Bandar Log, how we managed to win so easily, and what you can learn from it and what to do in your own games going in the future. So here we are, we're back on turn 24, just before the war started, and we're just having a little look at Bandar Log here. So we can see that they don't have as many territories as us, not even close by number of provinces. So we know we have a complete economic advantage over them, both in terms of the number of troops that we have and also probably the mages. They currently have their capital city uh, of Bandar Log with a fortress there, and they also have a palisade in Bethim. Meanwhile, we have one, two, three, four fortifications, some of which are upgraded as well. So therefore we have a higher amount of commander points per turn than them, which means we're automatically going to be having more mages, we're also most likely going to be having better commanders, depending on what national commanders you can make. And also because of the amount of provinces we have, we have a much greater diversity in what troops we can take. And I've also noticed I made a mistake. We actually have five. I completely forget about the Mosswoods. Although technically the Mosswoods doesn't really uh, help us that much in this war, other than the fact that it is our base of research. We're getting lots of mages whose entire job is purely to sit there and research. And that can't be overstated when it comes to this. It means that our research in terms of magic is going to be so much better than theirs is, especially for this point, part of the game. So yeah, because we have such a vast territory, we have a lot more money to spend on all the various things we need in war. Not only that, but I would sort of say in terms of a timing push, if you would like to think about it that way, we are currently in the better position. We're kind of towards where Ulm is at the best of its game, which is kind of the mid-game before most people get most of their mages and big spells online. That's when Ulm really wants to push forward with its advantage. You'll, you'll have a high enough concentration of troops that your troops should be able to beat most other people's troops, and just through sheer number of low-level mages, you should be able to outcompete other people's better mages but you should be at around about the same levels of research. Just because we can produce so many mages, we can keep up with research. We've also been ex exceptionally lucky this game in terms of our air randoms. We've managed to get lots of quills out. It's meant that we're at a better position in terms of research in comparison to where Ulm might be in a different game. Let's say if you've played along at home, you might have noticed that your research is lagging behind quite a few turns. That's absolutely fine. It just really depends how your expansion goes. Speaking about that, we can kind of go into a little bit about why I think Bandar Log was at such a poor position at the start of this war. One, they're being played by an easy AI. That can't be overstated. They are going to be a lot easier to deal with than a human player or even AI at higher difficulty. The fact that it is they'll be getting less resources, less gold than us, so we're at a very obvious advantage. Secondly, the, the weakness that they have is that their scales are awful. God awful. It seems like they've gotten some kind of really bad hell bless on, t or not hell bless, sorry, they've gone really bad hell scales in order to get a really strong god. Probably a really strong bless, but we never got to the point of the game where we could see it. This is always the problem when you have an imprisoned god. Doesn't matter how good your bless is, most of the best blesses are incarnate. And incarnate can only work when your god is out in the field. If you go imprisoned, you could be sitting there till turn 48, worst of the worst. That happened to me in one of my multiplayer games when I was playing Middle Age Mictlin uh, with a bunch of people. And my god just took forever to come out. And I had awful scales. I couldn't really do anything. I didn't have the magic diversity that I had on my god that I was waiting for him to come out to. And by the time that he did awake, the game was pretty much already decided. I was in a very weak position. I couldn't really expand and not only that but i was really curtailed by how just how bad my scales were i had a lot of misfortune i had turmoil i had sloth i couldn't produce many units i didn't have the money to afford the mages so if you're going for this really bad scales to get a good god i would say definitely don't go imprisoned try and go dormant unless your imprisoned god is there giving a bunch of non-incarnate blesses things like attack skill defense skill blur Blur is a really good one at the moment. Um, we'll probably see that get nerfed at some point, I think. But to be honest, it's also very good. Uh, it means that True Sight becomes more useful. That's also a non-incarnate bless, so it's very easy to kind of work around it. 
but that's kind of for kind of more for multiplayer ideas and i'll go into that a little bit more when i kind of go through the blesses for pretender design anyway we're in a really good position we have a lot of forces local to this area in white peaks where we have two commanders with nearly full armies and a bunch of additional troops they're there with mage support on the bar border with bandar log we also have a spare fortification not too far away building out the units that we need to crack through their castles easily not only that it is a good fortification and that has been upgraded and it has a lab and it has a temple let's say for example that our first foray into bandar log didn't go very well our army got beaten and they would start pushing back on us they would have to push so far back into our territory that we would be able to draw up troops from the felden forest from ulm from the land of pristine from all these various recruiting areas that they wouldn't be able to hold us off for long they don't have the scales for it they don't have the income for it because they don't have the territory for it and even though they are taking our territory the territory that they would be taking is the stuff that's been sitting in their dominion since the start of the game or very close to the start of the game so you've got places like the white peaks with its low population low income same with the silver woods gate is a little bit better but still only 61 income this is the issue when you have really bad scales specifically it looks like they had probably death four they must have had some kind of or probably death three actually but then they also had a bunch of misfortune and probably got very unlucky when it comes to some magical sites some events i mean when you're, you're choosing misfortune too that's really not a good idea we've had enough bad events in our game and we have neutral luck so having more events and a better chance than being bad I really just don't rate taking misfortune in Dominion 6. It's much worse than it ever was in Dominions 5 or Dominions 4. But yeah, anyway, even if they manage to, say, take all these provinces here, they'd still need to take this fortress at Elkland. Otherwise, we have an area where we can recruit pretty decent troops. We can recruit a pretty decent number of it. It doesn't have the best... Well, it has pretty good resources. It doesn't have the best recruitment points. But as long as we held on to that fort, there's nothing they could do. We also had Earth Snake. As soon as they start coming into our dominion, we have an awake pretender. We have a pretender who is there ready to battle on the field. He's really good. He's got really good uh, stats when it comes to his, his earth magic. We could do a lot more with him with magic stuff. We have so many mages who are ready to get there. We have the magic gem economy that we can do. start to do desperation plays if we really needed to. I mean, at, the, at this point in the game, we had 65 earth gems stored up we could just try and start dumping all of them into defensive spells if it started going badly we've won the early game with our expansion effectively part of that is due to the fact that we had an awake pretender awake pretenders do seem to be very important in dominion 6 at least as far as the testing that i've done with the increase in independent strength across the board unless you have a nation that you can guarantee that you're going to be able to do well in the early game you're gonna start to struggle especially in comparison to people who took awake pretenders and if they take awake pretenders there's a good chance they could potentially even threaten you within the first year if they have a, the right kind of units nations if they're an elf nation they have an awake pretender even an earth snack and they all of a sudden just decide well we're just going to sit in front of your capital what do you want to do you don't have the research to deal with that you don't have the troops to deal with that probably don't have the units to deal with that and you can't really recruit anything else so there's nothing you can do at that point i think rushes are going to become main strategy in dominion 6 even more so than they were in dominions 5 on the flip side if those rushes fail or you know if people do some smart dip low and you aren't able to take out that first opponent you need to start your snowball going you're gonna struggle against people who've gone scales certainly as it kind of comes into war more towards the late game and we, we're in the middle age and the amount of gold that we're getting here is quite insane for a random gen at this point, we're already making 6,000 gold per turn in income. Obviously, we have our upkeep on top of that, but the amount of troops you can get in Dominion 6 seems much higher than it was in previous iterations of Dominions. Anyway, so that, that this is what it's like at the start of the war. Let's kind of go on to our opening moves. So obviously, we moved from the White Peaks. We took over the Nidian Range, the Woods of Weeping. We took over this throne as well, so we could start pushing in our Dominion. As far as fort pl placement goes for the AI, I mean, Bethine wasn't an awful position. I would have potentially said that Barney would have been better because that way they would have had pretty good coverage over keeping us out of their eastern part. The issue that we had was that we had obviously expanded so much more than them in that we were already in Rotmarsh. 
and given the east to west wrap around in this map we were already there we also have pretty good vision over them because of our complete domination of the sea they had no way to contest that uh, they did have a couple of marrows i suppose they either got through a uh, marrow village or from a mercenary bid but i don't think that would have been able to well it might have been able to take some provinces but we could have sent our snack to go and deal with them overall they just didn't expand well enough um in order to counter us in this early part i think as well their armies they have their armies very spread out they did get very unlucky in that they lost the bright woods because of their misfortune scale to independence they seem to be taking a lot of independence attacks and being ai they also fluffed a couple of attacks so they lost troops whereas we had a pretty successful expansion all things considered i don't think we actually lost an expansion battle we came close but to my recollection i don't think we actually lost any of our expansion battles so because just purely because of the fact that we had a good expand not only in the amount of provinces that we took but also the amount of losses we took we've carried those troops into the mid game for us to use in our first war that's really important you want to make sure that you it doesn't matter if you manage to expand to 20 territories in the first year you lose all of your expansion troops you take really high attrition because you're not going to be ready for your first war and the ai is just going to come crashing into your conquered territories which are going to be far easier to take over for them because your province defense is nowhere near as strong as the independents are just now so you've basically just done all the hard work for them so they can reap the spoils of your uh, your conquests so there's no point taking the territory unless you can defend it and from that we can see that we have with our fortress placement we obviously have the one in elkland that we've talked about before then we have the forest of gila which is a fantastic choke point and so is the Elkland, to be quite honest, that they're going to be very hard pressed to get to our capital at any point. So our recruitment is never really going to be at risk. At worst, if they were to take Elkland, the Forest of Gila, and somehow the Land Pristine, if they were to siege all of those castles all at once, in terms of fortifications, we would still be at the same number of recruitment in terms of forts, but we're still producing more because our forts are better. We have more commander points. And then of course we also have the moss woods which we could have found a way eventually to figure out how to bring our troops over we would have figured it out we would have got some form of war mage either through a random mage underground probably or we would have focused on expanding more down there with some auxiliary armies just so we could get one so we get the rings of swimming or the boots of swimming sorry the rings of water breathing we'd start sending our mages out from the moss woods to come and help us defend us defend ourselves so this is how we're looking at the start of turn 24 let's head over to turn 26 because i saved uh, the turns at the end of every episode so i'll see you in a second so here we are in turn 26 so this is when abyssia also declared war on us we've done our opening moves inside the war and that we took the spring spire took the woods of weeping we took the Nidian range we also took barney halbritha our forces were in the correct positions to rapidly come into bandar logs territory and take out their armies mostly piecemeal also from a tactical view we're doing pretty well in that we've already split their nation in two so that any recruitments they make from Bethine and any recruits they make from Bandalog cannot get to each other without going through us first so because of that we can then dictate where and when we want to battle we're effectively getting them in defeat in detail not only that, but they have to be very careful. If say, let's say if you're in a multiplayer game, someone's doing this to you, you have to be very careful in anticipating the attacking nation's movements so that you're probably less concentrated forces. If everybody's grouped together, you probably have less units at this point. Your less concentrated forces cannot take their forces in a pitched battle. So you have to be very careful about where you're going to move your troops this is where things like magic phase attacks things like cloud trapeze or sneaking units become really effective in that they can get behind the front lines and start to take things in the back cut off retreats but yeah so otherwise we have a uh, complete local superiority of forces here we're now able to push out into the rest of bandar logs territory mostly through securing their two fortresses so by securing the fortresses we stop the remainder of their recruitment it also means the rest of their provinces will not be giving them gold which is also very important 
by completely cutting out their income it means they can't do use mercenaries they'll start to get a couple of desertions from the troops that they already have and by stopping the recruitment it means there are no more mages no more sacreds no more nothing they've just got what they have they can still use gems but given the fact that we haven't aren't really finding many sites here i don't think they've really been able to site search or had the time to i think we we couldn't tell because we didn't have scouts but i think they've been fighting off against a lot of independent uprisings for the whole game just because of their misfortune scales they seem to be much more common than they were previously speaking of scouts the fact that we have all of these scouts throughout Bandarlog's territory is a massive help we get a much better idea of what is in each province which you can get from mousing over the province with it selected it tells you how many units they think is in there and uh, you do get a little bit of an idea just from having people next to it but it's nowhere near as accurate as when you have a scout in there so by having all these scouts in here as well we can see the locations of all their armies where they can move so say this army here up in the copper canyons so we know that they can move to the Great Woods, Bandarlog, Rickbalcor, or the Range of Shadow. So from here we can decide, okay, where do we want to fight? They can only go into one of these places. We could send multiple armies in one of the one from Halbreath up to here, the one from Barmy up to here, the one in the Woods Weeping up to Bandarlog. One of them could potentially fight. They could also move to the Great Woods, so that is also an opportunity. Bandarlog could move into the Bright Woods, but that'd be an awful idea. Range of Shadow can get into Fenica, which we know because that crossing is blocked. The force here in Rid could move into Erebor, which they did, or into Halbretha, but why would they move into Halbretha? We've got a massive force there. We could move our guys down to Rid to take out this force here, or we could march on Bethine. The enemy doesn't have the ability to really combat us in terms of the tactical movement. We just have too many armies in comparison to how much they have. This would be the point in the game that if you were playing yourself, you'd be starting to bring out your thugs, your sort of... This would be the part of the game if you're playing yourself you'd be trying to take out your thugs the people that could take out small groups of armies semi-large armies with only a little bit of mage support you know do some uh point buffing or a big giant say or for a couple of your sacreds to make them into a really effective fighting force that could take out normally equipped troops by themselves fortunately for us at this point we've also come in with a bunch of mage support so we're able to sit there and go right we have a bunch of mage support they maybe will be able to use their thugs once or twice against us, but we can get some scripts together so that we can combat them pretty effectively. We haven't really had a chance to sort of just demonstrate that. I'll probably do a video in the future uh, about that at some point, just kind of like about basic thugging and what you can do. We've done a little bit, I have a very, very small amount of light thugging when we've been outfitting our Black Lords and such, but I'd hardly say Black Lords are a thug. They're more of a sort of raiding force. Uh, light thugs i guess you can call them where they're mostly just there to beat province defense they can't really take on a proper army by themselves especially if that army has a little bit of mage support they'll most likely just die or if you're playing against a human player in which case they'll know how to counter them as well which is also the issue so from what we can see at this point in bandar log we've managed to, as i say we've split off their two fortifications we have the massive increase in troop concentration in the area so even though the fact that abyssia is here and they've declared war on us they were so slow to the mark at this point in that we just had too high great concentration forces if abyssia had declared war on us a couple of turns early let's say they were down here in the caves and they were already marching into the mudwater caves or into miles deep at this point we would be on the backstroke because we didn't have the forces in the area to deal with it we potentially have to pull people back from elkland to come down to summer edge I think we still would have been successful in the Banderlog campaign, but I think it would have taken longer, and we probably would have taken more casualties, and they would have been able to fight back better. Anyway, so let's go into the next uh, turn so we can have a little look around again. Okay, so this is us here in turn 28, so this is when we decided to move on both of their fortresses. At this point, unless they have the research, which they probably won't, given that they have Drain 1, they have really bad heat, they have a lot of death, they've lost a lot of population. You can see here that they, at this point of the game, they have 30,000 population in their main province, and we have 44,000. The amount of population you have in capitals does vary slightly by a couple of hundred at the start of the game, but the fact that there's a 14,000 difference means a massive swing in income, in resources that you have, bad scales are bad. Only pick bad scales if you know what you're doing. 
or if you want to go for like a Mimi Hellbless, that's also fine. You do what you want. I, I've always been of the opinion that I prefer scales or scales nations to less nations. It's kind of what I feel more comfortable with, honestly. But with that, we are able to move on to both their fortifications so they can barely do any recruitment. From here, we were able to split our forces up. You know, we sent Adelaide up to the Copper Mouth. Copper Canyon, sorry, and into the Great Woods to cut off those provinces there. We sent the rest of our force to the Range of Shadow. We sent a bunch of our forces around Ridge, around Bethine, to Azamar. They have no other fortifications with which to get income. They're trapped. They're fighting two separate battles um, with vastly different forces, like the forces that we sent against Bethine versus the forces we sent to Bandalog are very, very different, which is also a really good idea if you're doing any kind of multiplayer game is to really diversify your forces as much as possible so it's harder to plan against for the opposing player. But yep, at this point, I think this has just been a, a not a perfect example. We did, we have taken a lot of friendly fire across this campaign. It's going to happen, uh, given that our guys, our frontline guys, do not have shields. Honestly, when I was recruiting those, the two-handed guys, so our infantry of Alm here, the guys with the, the battle axes, these guys were there mostly for expansion. That was my kind of idea process. I want these guys for expansion to be able to deal with heavy cavalry. Heavy cavalry is the bane of your existence in the early game. Anybody who is on a mount is also quite difficult. These guys have the damage. They could potentially kill a mount in one or two hits, you know, from a couple of guys in a square. Kill the mount, then probably kill the rider after he's taken his fallen off damage and maybe like a swing or two. And, then, and not take many casualties themselves because they've got good enough protection to go against the short bows. Now that we're coming out here and we have large, uh, well, not large in that one, but you you know what I mean, we have all of our Holberg crossbowmen, we have our sappers, we have our regular crossbowmen, there's a lot of armor-piercing damage coming out, you know, they're doing eight damage, it's armor-piercing, piercing, so we're reducing 65% of our armor on our infantry of Alm, they have no shield, so they're just basing it on their size to try and dodge the arrow, but if that arrow hits, you know, they're all the same size, we're gripped up, you know, there's there's a good chance it's going to hit somebody, we have no shield in order to parry it. So yeah, we're just going to get hit by arrows, people are going to get crippled, people are just going to take damage, people are eventually going to take enough damage, they're going to die, you know, you get hit by an arrow, get wounded, um, then the enemy is able to kill them in a strike, which normally wouldn't kill them in one shot, but that's because they're already injured. Probably what we could have done is when we were thinking about coming into Bandar Log, given that we had so many crosswomen, is we should have probably thought about recruiting more of these infantry of Alm. But I was also quite worried about the Tiger Riders, and I didn't really know what their bless was. I thought their bigger bless could come out. And again, these guys are really good for just killing mounts, for killing riders. That's also why we brought all of these guardians. These guardians were here to help us against the Tiger Riders. In the end, they weren't really used. Because the banner log never had enough tiger riders to actually come out at us in a large enough force to threaten us in that way. So when you're thinking of how you're going to put together your armies, you need to think about what your enemy's fielding, what can you field, what independent units can you bring, just so you have the best chance of victory. Like these slingers, normally I would never recruit slingers, but it's thinking, oh, well, we can potentially cast flaming arrows if the war goes on long enough. Not only that, as Bandar Log, they don't have very good units. A lot of their units don't have any protection or have very low protection or low HP. So even these slingers who are sitting here, you know, their sling does 10 bludgeoning damage. That's still double the HP of a Mercata. So they hit a Mercata with a sling, you know, you're firing enough stones, you're going to hit something eventually. Like that, that will, that will kill a Mercata pretty easily. So suddenly slingers are really good. I would never think about bringing slingers against Abyssia. We don't have the paths to really make them good. I mean, what can we do? We can use, you know, flaming arrows. Well, that's not going to do anything against Abyssians. We could use poison arrows, but we don't really have the paths to do that other than our Woodhenge Druids, which we need to give a bunch of nature mages to. We don't have a way of boosting them up. So we don't have large area effect uh, buffs for putting poison ranged attacks on our units. And not only that, but our own units can't do anything against the poison. The poison is at least armor piercing, if not armor negating. Let's have a quick double check of that. Yeah, so we can see here serpent fang arrows. It's plus five armor negating poison damage. We have no poison resistance as, as a nation for ourselves. We're completely reliant on our protection to help us. So every time one of our guys is getting hit by one of these slings, he's taken five armor negating poison damage. Sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. Depends on the Dominion's random number. 
but we'd suddenly start taking so many more casualties if we were starting to do that. Sure, those are really good against Abyssia. Abyssia probably doesn't have very much poison resistance, except maybe on some of the sacreds and some of his units. But that's a good way of taking them down, especially if you have nature mages. So keep that in mind. Keep that in your back pocket if you're facing off against early age Abyssia and you're wondering, what can I do? Oh, it's easy, get enchantment five. Sure, I'll do that in the first year. But in all seriousness, we do we have managed to sort of come out around Bandar Log and take a lot of the territory. We've moved our forces really well in that we're taking them out piecemeal. We've given ourselves time to take Bethine and then come back to Bandar Log, take it over one at a time. They can't really counter us. It's fantastic. Let's move on to another turn. So here we are, turn 33. So overall, that war took around about 10-ish turns. I think, I think it started at the late spring and then it lasted until early winter so but in that time we managed to completely wipe out about bander log we spent a little bit of time moving about obviously we had our issue where we didn't storm the castle of bethine when we meant to you know part of that i blame on me in that i'm obviously trying to explain things to you guys in these tutorials i'm not I'm not spending as much time on turns as I would do if I was playing a game my own time. Obviously, I want to make it exciting for you guys, kind of go through my thought process. The best thing about Dominions is it's turn-based. You can take turns as fast or as slow as you want to. Do it at your own pace. The slower you go, the less likely you'll miss something. And if you're in doubt, spend that extra 10 minutes, 5 minutes to just go over what you're doing and think if it's the best idea. For example, when it comes to the actual battle in Bandar Log, I'm sure I could have uh, could have scripted these mages far better. I could have placed them better. Our formations are a little bit of a mess. We could have consolidated troops. We could have had larger squads. We could have had a higher morale buff. But these things weren't really needed. I knew we were going to win. The main thing was just making sure that we had the spells that we need. We could see from the last episode those fallen fires really came in handy. We were going to win the battle anyway. But purely just from the fact that we had those extra damaging spells of those falling fires, I mean, it really helped us. It really kind of crumpled their front line when they came to the gate to defend. We we still got a little bit stuck. You can see the pathfinding is really bad on castles in that your units will get stuck and they'll try and move around each other, all get clumped up. They'll just get shot by the archers. They can't really do anything. And they're trying to hit the archers up on the walls when they can't. They have to go through the castle, come around to get behind them, and then they're not fighting their mainline troops that are holding the gate and you know uh, it's it's a pain but that was the whole idea behind the falling fires is we would use them to try and hit the guys either on the wall or in the gate and it worked fantastically we had a couple of misses a little bit of friendly fire but that's acceptable you know you're just gonna have to deal with that you're gonna lose some troops in a siege especially when you're storming it the main thing is we won the battle what could we have done better? We probably could have summoned more elementals. So elementals are really useful in that they can trample over defenders, especially if it's sort of human size or human adjacent nations are really good for giving you a really good force multiplier. Just cost you gems, really not a problem in the earlier middle age, maybe a little bit more in the late age. You kind of want to be a bit more canny with how you're spending gems in the late age. But for us, we had enough of a stockpile that we knew we could use them fine. Another tip for forts is obviously if you have any ghosts or any ethereal units, fantastic. They will pass straight through the wall. So if we look through uh, Bandar Log, well, I'll just pause it as soon as we come in so we're not deafened. Uh, I do apologize about that. By the last episode, I've playing it back, I realized just how loud all the crossbow bolts were. Do let me know in the comments if it is too loud or if you let me to turn down the settings as a tad, just because I know that was very loud. It was loud for me when I was watching it back. I can't imagine what it's like for you guys. But either way, so if we had uh, ethereal units or if we had uh, more astral mages to make people ethereal, then they would be able to pass through these walls without issue and they'd be able to come out here on the other side. That can be really useful if you get them there to attack rear through these walls. People like Therados with their easy access to spirits, really good for coming around so they can attack flanks. As well, if we had any flying units, of course we don't have any flying units, but if you had an air mage who can cast flying on people, if you've given people... Uh, winged boots for example so they can fly if they can just cast fly on themselves on like a small thug or a point buff sorry a thug to fly and then attack rear so then he would come in i mean you probably wouldn't want to do it on this pe these guys because they have all these elephants there but if say if these guys have gone past and he flies and he starts attacking these archers these yogis or even if he just started attacking the, the tiger riders a little bit that would be very very useful 
but your main aim of the game in siege battles is it's going to be a war of attrition curse of stones came out for us that was really good that meant everybody on the enemy team was taking a lot of fatigue more fatigue than us which means we win the attrition war which we will probably win anyway because of our protection so it's fantastic other great things you can do in castles you can do things like foul vapors you can do obviously falling fires that we used spam a bunch of earthquakes if your mages can live through it even if you bring them in without uh, support if you bring them back in with just a few troops say like we really wanted to be really cheeky we'd bring it in earth serpent we'd probably bring in a couple of our master smiths too with some armor extra armor on some earth gems they'd all cast iron skin on themselves and then they would all cast earthquake and that would do lots of damage to all these troops and then best of all you can just retreat you can just set your guys to cast and retreat so if we really want to be cheeky let's go back just so I can show you what I mean. So let's just say uh, we grab. So let's just say we grab our snake and we want to do a very, very cheeky build where we're just going to tell him to summon earth power, personal iron skin, earthquake, potentially earthquake twice if we're giving him a, enough gems that he can do that, and then just retreat. The best thing with our tactical position here is other than the bright woods, which we would have to take into consideration, there is a chance he could retreat there and be killed. We could also just send a force there because we are attacking Mandar Log at the same time. So we could send a small force there to make sure we're clearing out the bright woods before the retreat happens. And that's because uh, normal battles and siege battles happen at a slightly different time in the turn order. But we could do that and then no matter what happens, our guys would just retreat and they would be okay. They might, so some of our Master Smiths might die to earthquakes, but for massively weakening a defending force before your original engagement, fantastic really what you want obviously you have to be careful if you're playing as human opponents and that they could script something in order to get around that they could cast spells themselves um it really depends on what your opponent is doing it's why I, I really recommend that you have some form of scout probably one of the scouts that you've had in their territory for a while move on to the castle when it's nearing uh, the fortification going down just so you can do what we did where we send them in to attack them, to storm the castle by themselves, and then just retreat. Because you can see where the defenders are, if they've put any gems on them, which they might because they'll get the notification to say, oh, the castle, the fortification has just been breached, the enemy can attack at any time. If they're gearing up for a defense, they will do then. You could even send in a small force just to try and gem bay them so they don't have any more gems that can give you some indication of what their plan is it's not really the best thing because remember they're sitting on top of a laboratory most likely especially if it's their capital they're sitting on top of a laboratory they're going to have more access to gems than you they're going to be it's going to be far easier for them to instantly access gems that you'd either have to spend gems to send using air magic or bring up with your scouts or other commanders you've got to consider that before you go forward with your plan so what are my, my main takeaways from this Always try and defeat your opponent in detail if you can. If you have the superior force, attack them where they are weak. If you have the weaker force, you will want to try and use a bit more unconventional tactics. The more guerrilla tactics you can use, the better. If you have units that can sneak, fantastic. If you have units that can fly or magic phase move using things like cloud trapeze, teleports, whatever you have access to, even better. Those are the units that are going to help you win if you're in a far weaker position. Like cutting off the enemy's ability to easily get reinforcements up, cutting off the income from any provinces they have taken. Say if we were playing Bandar Log and we managed to take Strongdale, Civil World, Woods, and Oakland, wouldn't matter what territory we have taken from from that point on. We wouldn't be getting the income. Obviously, as Bandar Log, we wouldn't be getting the income either. But it makes it worse for Almen that they are spending gold to take the provinces and not getting anything immediate in return. At least for the early part. Other than that, most of the war is won through preparation, knowing what your opponent's going to be bringing to you. In which case, spies, if we were Bandar Log, and we saw all of this, not only this infrastructure, but all of the armies that we spent multiple turns moving up from the forest of Gila, through Coneberg, through Eklund, if we had spies there, we would have seen this attack coming long before it happened. By having these scouts, by having these independent uh, scouts that you can recruit in some of the provinces, you'll get forward notice if you pay attention to troop movements from an enemy nation 
So you'll be able to tell when an attack is coming before they actually either attack or declare war on you. So yeah, intelligence is really good. Tactical knowledge is really good. If you have to use your unconventional tactics, know how to do guerrilla tactics, know how to use sneaking units, know how to cloud trees. We'll probably talk about that in a future episode in that Ulm isn't the best at using magic phase. Also know what kind of research you want to hit, what evocation you have, what your mages can do and what you can do with them just now. And most of all, don't be scared to just slap some gems on them. If you're doing a final defense, slap as many gems on, on them as you can. Use your conjuration levels, your construction levels to summon national troops just so you can use them in defense before you go on to fight the last battles, which you'll hopefully win and make a miraculous comeback. Whether or not that'll happen remains to be seen. Anyway, I hope that there's a bit more of a rambling episode, but I just kind of wanted to go over a little bit of a retrospective of the Bandar Log War, just to go into a little bit more detail about what my thought, thought process was, you know, how you should kind of go about your war, uh, if you've never really fought a war with your first pretenders. This first war, it wasn't a traditional first war for us in a sense, and that happened quite late. But usually winning your first war decisively will put you on a fast track to winning the game or at least being in contention for winning the game in terms of the snowballing effect that you find in dominions especially if you turn around and you go well i've got all these good scales and i've got a decent god and i've just beaten somebody who's been trying to win in the early game fantastic you're gonna not only are you gonna have the diplo rep in that you've managed to beat somebody you probably shouldn't have beaten but you're also gonna have their territory their gems and going forward, you'll hopefully be in a very good position. Anyway, I hope that was helpful to you. I just want to kind of go over a little bit more about my thought processes just after it happened. Uh, in the next episode, we are obviously going to be taking the war to Abyssia, and we're going to see what kind of happens along there. We'll probably utilize a couple of our communions where we can, and then we will probably just take the throne in a couple of turns after we fought Abyssia for a little bit, just to bring the tutorial to a close, and then we'll start thinking about what we want to play next time. Anyway, as I said, thank you very much for watching. I hope this was helpful to you. Until next time, take care.